Hi everybody, I'm Lou Malino. I'm a practicing internist in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm also a hypertension specialist and I'm a cholesterol specialist and I'm an MDVIP affiliated doctor for the last six years. I'm doing this talk to help my colleagues and all of our patients and whoever else sees this eat better to prevent diseases in the future. I really developed a passion for nutrition about two years ago and it's transformed my practice. Let's face it, we're all about reaching our milestones. I wanna reach my milestones, and more importantly, I put a picture of my beautiful family here because I want them to reach their milestones. So consider this talk my way of paying it forward. This is the breakdown of the talk. We're gonna start by talking about what humans used to eat when we were healthy. And then we're gonna do one slide on nutrition science that I think the doctors are gonna like. We're going to talk about why we get fat, why it's not driven by behaviors, it's hormones driving behaviors. Then we're going to talk about calories, why calorie counting may not be the best way to drop weight and what might be the best way. Then we're going to talk about my diet, the diet that I eat, the diet that I've started dozens of willing patients on, and some success stories. And finally, we're going to wrap up with a couple of slides on aging and exercise. I have a couple of disclosures. Number one, I'm not a professional speaker. You get what you pay for, which brings me to my second point. I'm not getting paid for this talk. Finally, I've been married far too long to come up with any of my own ideas. And so I've given credit where credit is due. I've put in all of the authors uh, whose works I've read, whose websites I've visited that taught me this stuff. And at the end of the talk, I'm gonna flash up a slide with all of their book pictures on it so that you can learn more about this too. All right, let's get started. I think everybody's gonna recognize this as a version of the USDA food pyramid. This is what the US government tells us we're supposed to eat. And I guess what we need to do is ask ourselves the question, is this really what we're supposed to eat? Is this what we're genetically adapted to eat? I think we're all gonna agree that each species grows up, learns to survive and thrive in its own environment, eating a specific set of foods. Lions eat meat, sharks eat fish, koala bears eat eucalyptus leaves, and that's how they do well. What's our environment? What were we supposed to eat? Well, our environment's changed a lot. Humans have been around for about two and a half million years. And up until 10,000 years ago, our bodies never saw a single food on the bottom of this food pyramid. These six to 11 grains that we're supposed to eat a day that form the base of our diet, we never saw it until 10,000 years ago. Anybody out there know what happened 10,000 years ago that changed things? It was the agricultural revolution. That's when we went from being hunters and gatherers to being food producers. And it was at that time that these foods, and we'll call them carbs for the rest of the talk, became a bigger and bigger part of our grocery stores, a bigger and bigger part of our pantries, and a bigger and bigger part of our plates and they're contributing to diseases. I'll give you an interesting fact about milk on the top left-hand side of the slide. The first glass of milk wasn't consumed until 9,000 years ago. Somehow humans made it two and a half million years without this stuff. 65% of the world's population gets sick drinking milk. We're the only species on the planet that drinks another animal's milk for our entire life. Cats will do it, but you have to give it to them. Are we really supposed to drink this stuff? On this slide, you'll see human evolution and devolution. Uh, the tall man and the heavier modern man are separated by only 10,000 years. Anthropologic evidence shows that at one point we were all leaner, we were taller, and we were more muscular until the introduction of foods that our bodies just don't tolerate. Those are the grain-based foods. It takes 40,000 to 100,000 years for our genes to change when there's a permanent change in the environment. But there really have only been 10,000 years separating these people. And so their genes are still virtually identical. And so the question we need to ask is, what was this tall, lean hunter-gatherer eating that made him appear so healthy? He was eating high quality animal source protein. It was all grass fed. It was all organic. It was all pesticide free. He was eating fish, but the fish wasn't from fish farms. The fish was wild caught. He was eating insects and he was eating eggs and he wasn't throwing away the yolks. Our 
ancestors coveted fat. Fat was calorie rich, it was nutrient dense. We were not good hunters for a long time until we got very good with the spear. Before that, we used to follow packs of lions around. They'd clean everything off the bone. We would bash open the skulls and eat the brains. We would bash open the bones and eat the bone marrow. This is saturated fat and monounsaturated fat. And that's how humans survived until we became much better hunters. What were our carbohydrates back then? They were vegetables and fruits, primarily vegetables. The fruits were smaller. They were fibrous. They were tart. They weren't the giant fruity sugar balls of today. And yet somehow, we survived as a species. We grew taller. Our brains grew in size and in capacity, all without a single grain-based carbohydrate in our diet. This is the only heavy chemistry slide I'm gonna put in here, and I think our doctors and some of our patients are gonna enjoy this. These are the three food groups. We've got protein, we've got carbohydrates, and we've got fats. What do you get when you put them all together? You get a cheeseburger. So why do we eat? We eat for two reasons. We eat to produce energy to use that second, and we eat to store energy for when we're not eating, like when we're exercising, when we're sleeping, and in between meals. What kind of energy does our body use? Well, we need to convert the food that we eat into usable energy by the body, which as you'll remember from high school chemistry, is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Every single cell, every single function in our body, Every muscle contraction, every muscle relaxation, every second of our lives requires ATP. Without it for just seconds, we're dead. Anybody out there know what poison stops ATP production in just seconds and kills us just like that? It's cyanide. So what is metabolism? Metabolism is our ability to take the energy stored in the chemical bonds in food and convert it into usable energy by the body, ATP. Uh, we've all heard that protein has four calories or kilocalories per gram. Carbohydrates have four kilocalories per gram, while fat has more than double that. Why is that? Well, it's because the energy stored in protein is stored in lower energy bonds. We don't get as many calories when we break those bonds. Those are nitrogen-based bonds. In terms of carbohydrates, they're held together, the sugar molecules are held together with oxygen-based bonds. Those are also lower energy bonds. In terms of fats, they're much higher energy bonds. Those are carbon to carbon, carbon to hydrogen bonds. Those release a lot more energy. So in terms of how much ener energy we get per molecule of sugar or glucose, we get about 36 ATP per molecule of glucose. How much do we get for each molecule of fat? We get a lot more, it's about 130 ATP. So fat is a much richer source of energy. So that's usable energy. How do we store energy? We can store it in two ways. We can store it as sugar, but you can't store sugar. Sugar gets turned into a storage form called glycogen. And glycogen can only get stored in two places in the body. Your liver, which can take about 500 calories, and your muscle, which can take about 1,500 calories. So you only have 2,000 calories of stored sugar in your body. That's about enough to run a 5K or a 10K. How many calories does someone thin have when it comes to fat storage? we have at least 100,000 calories of stored fat. We shouldn't have to eat for a very long time, but most of us run on sugar. And the key is how do we convert to using that fuel tanker of fat we have stored as a fuel source? I'm ultimately gonna vilify carbohydrates, so I wanna define carbohydrates. Carbohydrates simply are sugars. Now there are simple sugars like glucose, which is used by every single cell in our body. There's only one cell in our body that has to use sugar and can only use sugar, and that's a red blood cell. Every other cell in our body can burn fat or can burn something else called ketones, which we only make if we really drop our carbohydrates down. So what's table sugar? Table sugar is a molecule of glucose linked to a molecule of fructose, 50-50. What's high fructose corn syrup? High fructose corn syrup is just like table sugar, but it's a 55-45 mix of fructose to glucose. Fructose is fruit sugar, it's a lot sweeter. High fructose corn syrup is also a poison because it's cheaper than sugar and our bodies turn it immediately into fat. What's lactose? Lactose is made up of a glucose and a galactose. 65% of the world's population gets sick. How do we fix that? We put lactase enzyme into the milk, which breaks the oxygen bond holding those two sugars together. 
All right, you can see on the slide we have starch. What is starch really? This is white bread here. What is it really? Well, to me it looks like a sugar, a sugar, a sugar, a sugar, a sugar, linked together. Underneath of that, it's called dextrin. Let's pretend it's whole grain bread. What is whole grain bread? To me, it looks like a sugar, a sugar, a sugar, a sugar, a sugar, in a different branching configuration. Here's a branching configuration of some carbohydrate. It could be white bread, it could be whole grain bread. Ultimately, our bodies break any carbohydrate we eat into sugars, and that sugar ends up in our bloodstream where it wreaks havoc. All right, let's talk a little bit about protein, and I'm only gonna do one slide on protein. Two interesting protein facts. Number one, protein has the greatest thermic effect of any food. What's that? Well, in order to get energy out of food, we need to invest calories to burn it up. And you need to invest about five times as many calories to burn protein and turn it into ATP as you do fat or carbohydrates. We all have, after exercise, about a 45 minute window during which if we consume some high quality animal source protein or whey protein powder or egg whites, we're gonna rebuild muscle better and we're gonna recover quicker. My perfect post-meal workout snack is egg whites and raisins. Raisins are the most basic, meaning alkaline food out there, and the blood tends to get a little bit acidic after we exercise. So the raisins help to neutralize that acidity. What is fat? When we look at a piece of meat and we see the marbling in there, well, that's triglycerides. Triglycerides, if you look at this slide, are really three fatty acids linked to a backbone called glycerol. When we eat them, our body digests them into free fatty acids which circulate around our bloodstream and can either be used as energy or get stored as fat. If you look at the types of fatty acids, you've all heard of these fatty acids. You've heard of saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. Saturation means that there are no double bonds in a saturated fat. Every carbon molecule has as many hydrogens attached to it as possible. Examples of saturated fats, red meat, cheese, butter, chocolate, and a very healthy one we're gonna get to later called coconut. Monounsaturated fat, mono means one double bond. It puts a kink in it and usually turns it into a liquid. Examples of monounsaturated fats, avocado, olives, olive oil, and certain nuts, macadamia is probably the best one. These are the healthiest of all of the fats, lower cardiac risk, lower stroke risk, big part of the Mediterranean diet. Polyunsaturated fats are two types. I break them into two types called omega-3s. We've all heard of those, omega-3 supplements or fish oils. Those are the healthy anti-inflammatory polyunsaturated fats, where omega-6s are the inflammatory saturated fats corn oil, soybean oil, all the vegetable nut and seed oils other than macadamia oil. The polyunsaturated fats make up cell membranes in our body while the saturated and monounsaturated fats are stored. If we have a choice what to burn, we burn saturated fat first. So now we're gonna to shift to what makes us fat. And what really makes us fat is hormones. And it's the hormone insulin that's driving this whole process. Here in the slide, you'll see sugar molecules floating around the bloodstream. So we've eaten our bagel or our bread or our Cinnabon, and here's this sugar. This sugar floats by our pancreas and leads to insulin release. Insulin's job is to get sugar out of our bloodstream and into our cells because that's where it has to be to become ATP, to become energy. It doesn't do us any good in our bloodstream. Think of insulin as a key that unlocks the door, the receptor on every single cell and allows sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cell. Here it is for you docs a little more scientifically. We've eaten our Cinnabon or our bagel and there's our sugar. That sugar has triggered insulin release from the pancreas. Insulin touches down on its receptor and after a series of chemical reactions, a channel appears in the cell membrane, allowing sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cell where one of three things can happen. Number one, if it's a liver or a muscle cell, you can store some of that sugar as glycogen. Number two, we may need energy that second, so some of that sugar could get turned into ATP. But what if our stores of sugar are full? Because we're chronically eating a high carbohydrate diet. 
And what if we don't need energy that second? Well, that sugar you've eaten that's made its way into the cell then becomes fat. And that's called de novo lipogenesis, which in English means the making of new fat. And that fat is saturated fat, and that's how we become fat. So insulin, the hormone, is what's contributing to making us fat. Here's an experiment. You'll see on the y-axis is an insulin level, and time on the x-axis out to about four hours. Here's two patients. One patient has been given a sugary drink. You know, here it's a glucose tolerance test, but it could be a Coke, it could be a glass of orange juice. And after they've had this drink, their insulin level shot up and it stayed up for four hours before it normalized. So for four hours, this person is in energy storage mode. Now look at the other person. This person has done a fat tolerance test. Let's pretend they ate an avocado, pure healthy fat. What happened to their insulin level? Nothing. Fat doesn't raise insulin level. So the point with this slide is eating fat doesn't make you fat. Eating things that trigger insulin release, like carbohydrates, make us fat. All right, on this slide, we see a giant blob of fat. It's called white adipose tissue, but that's fat. On the lower left corner, we see sugar entering the cell. We've already gone over that. Insulin helps sugar into the cell. Now, this is a fat cell, so sugar can't be stored. It either has to be used as energy, or guess what? It gets turned back into fat in a fat cell. But insulin does something else that's pretty nasty. It also upregulates a hormone called LPL, lipoprotein lipase, which reaches out into our bloodstream and grabs circulating fat, triglycerides, and brings them into the fat cell. So not only does insulin bring sugar into the cell and turn it into fat, it brings fat into the cell and constructs it back into fat. What else does insulin do? And here's the kicker. Insulin shuts off the enzymes that allow fat to escape from our fat cells. It acts as a prison guard against fat release from our fat cells by shutting down the enzymes that cause something called lipolysis, the breakdown of fat. Here's a slide which shows that if you combine carbs and fat in a meal, you're more likely to end up gaining weight. If you just ate the burger, you'd be okay, but who eats the burger without the bun and the fries? If you just ate the butter, you'd be okay, but who doesn't put their butter on a bagel? And ice cream, that's the whole package. All right, our goal is to get rid of this. Now, how do we do it? We do it by removing the prison guard. Insulin is the prison guard against fat release. So this slide is called the insulin trap. We've eaten our carbs, they've turned into sugar, they've caused insulin release. Insulin has put fat into fat cells and turned sugar into fat inside fat cells, and now it's trapping fat release. So how do you get rid of that fat from the fat cell? This slide shows fat breakdown on the y-axis. At the top is maximal fat breakdown. That's what we want. And it shows your insulin level on the x-axis. Looks to me like we've really got to get our insulin level down in order to maximize fat breakdown, which we call lipolysis. In my practice, we do insulin levels, and I've found that if I can get patients' insulin levels significantly below nine, patients enter a state of lipolysis where we have pretty successful weight loss. If I'm really being good, my insulin level's down between two and four, typically. We have one hormone devoted to lowering blood sugar, but we have four hormones devoted to raising blood sugar. You docs know what they are. Cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and glucagon. I think at this point in our lives, with the toxic food environment the way it is, we need more hormones to lower blood sugar and less to raise it. I wanna give a slide about coffee because I think everyone's guilty drinking their coffee, but coffee, in my opinion, is the second healthiest beverage on earth. Why do athletes drink coffee right before a race? It's not just to get the caffeine buzz, which we all get because caffeine hits receptors in the brain. Coffee causes fat release from fat cells. It stimulates lipolysis. What else does coffee do that's good for us? Well, it's great at preventing Parkinson's disease, dementia, liver cancer, prostate cancer, type 2 diabetes. It's been shown to reduce stroke risk. So don't feel guilty about drinking your coffee. It may help. This is a slide that shows something very interesting, and that is that weight gain may not be our fault. It may be the toxic food environment. Here we've got a patient who's eaten all the wrong things. 
bagels, bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, doesn't matter if it's white, doesn't matter if it's whole grain, he's driven his insulin level up. That's what hyperinsulinemia means, which has blocked fat breakdown. That's what inadequate lipolysis means, which has caused three things to happen. Number one, he's heavy. If you're not breaking down your fat, you're staying fat. Number two, high insulin levels drive appetite. So this person is chronically hungry. And number three, when our insulin levels are chronically high, our body does something that's not fair. It cuts down metabolism by about 20%, which makes us not want to move. And so that all leads to the behaviors of overeating and being sedentary called gluttony and sloth, to borrow terms from Dr. Lustig's book. What else does high insulin drive? Drive something very bad that none of us want to get called cancer. On the next slide, this is a slide of someone who has a history of colon cancer. This is a PET scan. How do you do a PET scan? Well, a PET scan is done by drawing a patient's blood, labeling their blood with sugar, but you put an isotope on the sugar so that you can find it on a scan, and then we re-inject their blood labeled with sugar back into their body, and we follow the sugar to see where the sugar goes. Where does sugar go? Sugar goes to cancer. And that's what this patient has. He has a recurrent colon cancer that's lighting up. Why does cancer use sugar? Because it can only use sugar. Cancer has lost the ability to use fat or other energy sources. Our cells are a lot smarter. We can burn sugar, we can burn fat, and we can burn ketones. Very interesting that certain diabetic drugs are now showing anti-cancer properties, like the diabetic drug metformin, which lowers uh, the incidence of cancer recurrence in multiple different cancers in patients simply have better outcomes. Now there are cancer studies underway looking at low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets, very low carbohydrate diets, uh, and outcomes. Let's shift to talking about calories. It's all about calories in, calories out, right? The first law of thermodynamics. If we want to lose weight, we better count calories. Not in my book. Here's what it's really about, and I modified this slide from a fantastic website called The Eating Academy, which Dr. Peter Atia runs. It's absolutely fabulous. What we really need to focus on is what kinds of calories we're putting in our body. Let's do an experiment. We're going to take two patients. One patient, we're going to give bagels and jelly, just bagels and jelly, 2,000 calories worth for two weeks in a row. That's all this person gets to eat. The other person's gonna get 2,000 calories of avocados for two weeks in a row. Then we're gonna measure insulin levels at the end of two weeks. Whose insulin level's higher? The person that's been eating all the carbohydrates. That person is storing fat, they're more sedentary. Person that's been eating avocados, their insulin level has remained normal. Now on the other side of the slide is our total energy expenditure, all the calories we burn in a day. And that's made up of our resting energy expenditure called, called our basal energy expenditure. That's about 60% of the calories we burn. That's what we burn when we're sleeping, sitting on the couch, thinking, heart beating, breathing. We've got activity and exercise, which together combine for about 30% of our calories. And then we've got our thermic effect of food which, remember, eating more protein increases the thermic effect of food or calorie burning. And that's about 10%, a little more if you do more protein. What happens if we exercise? What happens to insulin levels if we exercise? They drop, and that drops your appetite, and that may also increase your desire to do more exercise. And so each of the sides of this equation are related. There's one more hormone we need to know about, and it's called leptin, and leptin is a cool hormone. Leptin is the I'm full, it's time to stop eating, it's time to start burning energy hormone. And here's how it works. We eat, fat gets stored, fat cells make leptin. Again, leptin is the I'm full, it's time to stop eating hormone. Leptin feeds back to an area of our brain we've all heard of called the hypothalamus, at the base of the brain about the size of a thumbnail, and leptin says, that's it, we're done eating. But there's something that blocks the leptin signal from reaching the brain. What could that be? It's high levels of insulin. High levels of insulin from eating chronically high carbohydrate diets don't allow our brains to see that we have fat and calories stored. And so what happens? We are in a state of perceived starvation. Our brains can't see that we've got all these calories. Here it is animated. 
On one hand, when things are working properly, leptin feeds back to the brain, signals the brain that we're full. We have enough fat calories stored to stop eating. And the side of the nervous system, called the sympathetic nervous system, gets activated. And when that's activated, a couple of things happen. Number one, we feel good. We want to do stuff. We start burning fat for fuel. This also shuts off the vagus nerve, which is the part of the nervous system that's responsible for raising insulin levels and storing energy. And what happens? Our fat shrinks. But when things are not working so well, it looks like this. Leptin comes in and never quite makes it to the brain. Insulin blocks it from getting there. The other side of the nervous system is then activated, and that's the vagus nerve. And that's the part of the nervous system that causes the pancreas to release insulin, causes more energy and fat calories to be stored, and slows us down. It cuts down our activity level. Consequently, in that case, we are getting fatter. And so the point of this slide is that insulin and leptin, two hormones, are driving the behaviors of gluttony and sloth, overeating and being sedentary. Does anyone choose to be obese? No, certainly no child would choose to be obese. That's a hard life. The obesity is being driven by hormones in our body and by the wrong food choices. This is a leptin deficient mouse. This mouse was genetically created to be deficient in leptin. There are only 13 or 14 humans on the planet that have leptin deficiency. This mouse eats constantly. He is in a constant state of perceived starvation because his brain is never getting the leptin signal. He won't move unless there's food placed on the other side of the cage. That's how deactivated his metabolism is. He wants to not burn a single calorie because he perceives starvation. The other mouse is having normal mouse thoughts. This is the human equivalent of that mouse. Because humans are not often leptin deficient, there are billions of humans on the planet that are leptin resistant. What do you think's going on in this person's body? Well, here it is. His insulin levels are chronically high from, as you can see, making some bad food choices. The insulin is blocking leptin from reaching his brain. Consequently, his brain perceives starvation and he is constantly hungry. He's in a constant state of fat storage because his insulin levels are high. And as a result of all this and his perceived starvation, his motivation to move is just deactivated. On the left of this slide is a person who has acromegaly or gigantism. This is caused by a tumor in the pituitary gland that releases too much growth hormone. No one is gonna argue the fact that this is a hormonal problem. Now on the other side of the slide, is this not a hormone problem? Is this not a problem related to leptin and insulin? I think it is. The behaviors of gluttony and sloth, overeating and not moving, are not driven by choice. They're driven by the wrong food choices and hormonal results of those food choices. How do we get ourselves healthy again? So what do we want out of a diet? We want a diet that keeps us lean or gets us lean. We want a diet that treats diabetes or prevents it. We want a diet that's gonna help us prevent cancer. We want a diet that's gonna help us prevent heart disease. And we want a diet that's gonna help us prevent dementia. Common to all of these conditions, high insulin levels. The diet that I eat and the diet that I've started dozens and dozens of my patients on is called the paleo diet. I would not say that this is right for everyone, but after you hear this, it's something you may want to discuss with your doctor. To me, this is making smart food choices to prevent a lot of the diseases uh, that modern food choices are causing. This is the paleo diet in a nutshell. The paleo diet includes eggs, and we don't throw away the yolks, any meat, fish, chicken, turkey, but the meat has to be grass-fed, the fish has to be wild-caught, and Eggs should be from free-range chickens, as healthy as possible. We eat plenty of fruits and vegetables with a preponderance of vegetables, and we eat nuts, seeds, and plenty of oils and fats. What don't we eat on the paleo diet? Well, we've already talked about dairy. Dairy is not a part of the paleo diet. No dairy counts in this diet. All grains and legumes are out 
for reasons we'll talk about in just a second. Meats and fish, as I said, have to be chosen carefully. Fun fact, two slices of whole grain bread produce more of a rise in sugar and more of a rise in insulin than a Snickers bar. This is a grain. This could be a grain of wheat to make bread, or this could be a grain of rice, for instance. You can see the grain kind of looks like an M&M. At the very bottom is the germ. That's the next generation of grain. That's the growing embryo. In the middle, called endosperm, that's a bunch of starch that's feeding the growing germ. And around it is bran, which is fiber. So what does a grain have that might be bad? Well, grains, like a lot of immobile objects, do things to protect themselves because once you eat the grain, the life of the grain is over. And what they do to protect themselves is they make certain proteins called lectins. You've all heard of these. You may not know it was a lectin, but gluten is a lectin. Another lectin is called wheat germagglutinin. Lectins are proteins, and normally our bodies would break down these proteins. But these grains are smart, and they make something called protease inhibitors, which prevent our guts from breaking these proteins down. These proteins end up entering our bloodstream, where they're recognized as foreign invaders, and we make antibodies against them. And when we do that, sometimes those antibodies recognize other things. In the case of gluten, they recognize the gut. They can recognize the thyroid. Some of these lectins might cause an antibody that recognizes the coating of our nerve cell and may cause MS. What else does the grain do? It has these things called zonulins. Zonulins are proteins that punch holes in our gut and allow more of these proteins to enter. And finally, and this one to me is pretty neat, grains produce something called exorphins. Exorphins are kind of like endorphins, which give you the exercise high, only this is the high you get from eating sweet, grain-based, processed foods. Here are some success stories. This is Lauren. Lauren is one of my employees. She could probably run her own company as a CEO, but I'm lucky enough to have her. And she was not living in the body she thought that she should be in. And so we spoke, and my mother, who's one of our employees, harangued her a little bit. And finally, she agreed to give this paleo diet a try. And nine months later, she lost 76 pounds and is a different person. This is another one of my patients who gave me permission to use this slide. This is a brilliant pharmacist who, again, used to be athletic, used to be lean, wasn't in the body he thought he should be in. He thought he was eating healthy, but we put him on a paleo-style diet with some modifications because everybody needs to modify a little bit. And here he is, 15 to 20 pounds lighter, leaner, looking like that prehistoric man before modern man in that evolution slide. This is a 46-year-old doctor who knows a little something about prevention. He cut his head off because he was so embarrassed that he took a selfie in the bathroom and forgot to edit out the toilet paper roll. Nevertheless, this is someone whose office has the capability of scanning carotid arteries, looking for plaque in carotid arteries long before it would manifest. And this plaque was present at much greater amounts than this doctor thought he should have. And so he had grown up eating three bowls of cereal, tasty cakes, peanut butter and jelly. He went on the paleo diet approximately two years ago. These were his results after one year of eating paleo. He went from 15% body fat. This is what 8% body fat looks like. Common to all of these patients, typically is a carbohydrate intake below 100 grams. Now everybody's got a different carbohydrate threshold. I might be able to eat 120 grams of carbs before my insulin level goes up. Somebody else may only be able to eat 70 grams of carbs. What I have a lot of my patients do is track their carbohydrate intake with a free online app or smartphone app. What about eggs? What is the story with eggs? I think we've all sort of had this fear of eating eggs or certainly eating the yolks. Studies show that if you're eating a low carbohydrate diet, egg yolks will not raise your cholesterol. And two eggs, two raw eggs, have more antioxidants than an apple, believe it or not. Eggs also have a lot of helpful substances that may actually reduce inflammation in the body. For those doctors out there, I put a little sciency piece in here. Our guts see about 2,000 milligrams of cholesterol every day. 90% of that cholesterol comes from bile. It doesn't come from the diet. So dietary cholesterol really has very little impact on our blood cholesterol levels. 
Canada recognized this years ago and did away with any cholesterol intake guidelines. Why don't we preferentially absorb dietary cholesterol? Because we actually have to de-esterify dietary cholesterol. Bile is already de-esterified, so if both are present, we're going to preferentially absorb bile. It's just easier for us to do. Here's an example of my breakfast. My breakfast is one whole egg, two or three other egg whites. I have a half of an avocado, which is good, healthy, monounsaturated fat. And I have a half to a cup of berries. Berries are the lowest glycemic fruit out there. So what do I get out of this? Well, from the egg yolk, I get choline. What's choline? Well, choline turns into a neurotransmitter that helps us remember things better, called acetylcholine, in our brains. The egg yolks are also rich in lutein and zeaxanthine. People pay big bucks for these ocular antioxidants to help prevent macular degeneration, which egg yolks do. The protein, remember, it's going to increase my calorie burning because it increases the thermic effect of food. And there are about 6 grams of protein per egg weight, so this amounts to about 24 grams of protein. What oils should we cook with? There are only two oils that you should be cooking with if you're eating a paleo-style diet. For low heat cooking, olive oil. For higher heat cooking, we want to go with coconut oil. We've all had the experience where we put oil in a pan, we turn our backs, the oil's brown. That brown oil is synonymous with rust. That's what we call oxidation. And when an oil oxidizes, it's lost a lot of its health properties and potentially picked up some very unhealthy properties like a propensity to end up inflaming or getting into our arteries a little better. Olive oil will brown once you exceed low heat. Coconut oil typically doesn't brown and coconut oil is a very rich source of lauric acid. Lauric acid is a shorter saturated fat than the ones in chocolate and cheese and red meat. It's got some really interesting properties in that it helps improve gut health. It helps reduce the chances of that leaky gut syndrome, which you can get eating grain-based foods. It improves insulin sensitivity, which actually can help burn a little belly fat. And that lauric acid, as a medium-chain triglyceride, improves our sense of fullness and, just like protein, turns on calorie burning. This is an example of my lunch. My lunch is always a salad, and as the base leaf, I put spinach in there. Spinach is full of healthy flavonoids. Not only does it have a little protein and a lot of calcium, but it's full of flavonoids that help maintain a healthy gut, and it's the best vegetable on earth at reducing aggressive forms of prostate cancer. I also have a bag of nuts. I have jerky, that's what's in the other bag. I have turkey, and then I have the other half of the avocado that I had in the morning. The secret to the salad is a full tablespoon or two of extra virgin olive oil, which helps me maintain fullness. On the salad, I'm also putting slices of wild-caught salmon, which I get at the store. It's lox. Lox is full of salt, but if you're eating a low-carbohydrate diet, you actually will pee out a lot of your salt. When insulin levels drop, you pee out salt, and that's initially where all your weight loss comes from. I throw olives into the salad, more monounsaturated fat and plenty of vegetables, which we'll get to. There are three pieces of fruit in this slide. That's too much fruit, and I actually don't do that anymore. This is from the summer. I typically will do two pieces of fruit, which amount to 25 to 30 carbs, and I'll do a full pepper instead. What nuts are the healthiest nuts? Well, we want to base our choice of nuts on the ratios of unhealthy inflammatory polyunsaturated fats to healthy omega-3 type polyunsaturated fats. Historically, our ancestors used to eat a ratio of about 1 to 1 or 2 to 1. Our modern ratio, if you're eating the typical American diet, is 15 or 20 to 1 in favor of the inflammatory types of omega-6s. The best nuts in order, walnuts, macadamia nuts, and pecans. What about almonds? Aren't they the healthiest? Well, not really if you look at this slide. Almonds have an incredibly high ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s. But that's okay, as long as you include plenty of omega-3s in your diet that day, either as a fish oil supplement or as fish, to even out that ratio. What about peanuts? Well, peanuts are not nuts at all. Peanuts are legumes. And peanuts also have lectins, because all legumes do. And peanut oil lectin actually finds its way into our coronary arteries pretty easily. We actually use it in experiments to create heart disease in rabbits and other primates. So I would try to stay away from peanuts. Instead of peanuts, 
we do almond butter. What fruits are the best? Well, this is a ranking based on a magazine study that ranked fruits based on calories, sugar, fiber content, antioxidant capacity, omega-3, and vitamin content. What fruit do you think is the healthiest fruit of all? Blackberries, followed by raspberries, followed by guava, followed by strawberries, followed by cranberries. Blueberries, to my surprise, are about number 10. Apples are 25 on the list. What do you think the least healthy food is? It's grapes, the sweetest of all. It's got the most sugar. Bananas are number 28. Average size banana is about 25 grams of carbs. It adds up. This is an example of one of my dinners. This is two grass-fed burgers, which we're gonna get to in one second, a bunch of blueberries. Blueberries have a dark pigment. That dark pigment is called anthocyanins. All the dark berries have those. Anthocyanins are incredibly heart healthy. They can reduce cardiac risk. They reduce cardiac inflammation. They actually increase new brain cell formation, which is kind of neat. And they can reduce diabetes risk. The peppers, I include many times a week. If you eat peppers more than twice a week, there's a 30% drop in the chance of getting Parkinson's disease. Peppers are in the tobacco family, and we know that smoking reduces your risk of Parkinson's disease. So my advice, include as many colored peppers in your diet as possible. I mentioned grass-fed beef. Well, this is the difference between grain-fed beef, which almost all of us eat if we don't look for grass-fed, and grass-fed beef. Corn-fed or soy-fed, grain-fed beef is the equivalent of an obese couch potato cow that's munching Doritos and drinking beer all day. Grass-fed beef, on the other hand, is like an NFL wide receiver, lean. What's in grass-fed meat, though, that makes it so special? Well, first of all, it's an incredibly rich source of vitamins A and E, very important antioxidants. It's a rich source of a special vitamin called vitamin K2 that's only recently been discovered. And you can only get K2 in grass-fed products or a fermented soy called natto, which they eat in the Far East. Vitamin K2 does something very interesting in our bodies. It helps us to keep calcium in the right places. When we have a good vitamin D level, we absorb our calcium. Our calcium is supposed to end up in two places only, our bones and our teeth. But sometimes it ends up in the wrong places, like your carotid artery or your coronary artery. We do coronary calcium scores looking for plaque in the arteries. Well, vitamin K2 turns on enzymes that pump it out of arteries and pump it into the places it's supposed to be, like bones and teeth. What else does grass-fed meat have? It has something called CLA, conjugated linoleic acid. That's a trans fat, but trans fats are bad, right? Yes, true, but those are man-made trans fats. This is a natural trans fat that in many studies has shown tremendous anti-cancer properties. It also is a much better source of omega-3s and the ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s in grass-fed meat is perfect. This is another example of one of my dinners. This is salmon with spinach and some strawberries. Am I full after eating this? Not quite. We do snack at night and we make tons of paleo muffins, paleo pancakes. The things that we enjoy as part of the typical American diet, we just don't use grain-based flours. We use almond flour or we use coconut flour. We use alternatives, but they taste great. I always eat dark chocolate at night. Remember to buy 72% or greater. Those healthy flavonoids also improve brain health. And I sometimes will snack on almond butter uh, and I'll use something like a cut up apple to dip it in. This is a sciency slide for everyone that looks at a group of postmenopausal women who are overweight. Their body mass indexes are over 27, who for five weeks have eaten a paleolithic style diet. And what's shown on this slide is that the fat content of their livers dropped dramatically in five weeks. Not only that, but they lost an average of 10 pounds, three inches around their waist. They also had a drop in blood pressure, a drop in sugar, a drop in their insulin level, their cholesterol dropped, their triglycerides dropped, their LDL, their bad cholesterol dropped eating eggs and meat. And most importantly, the number of nasty cholesterol particles, which we MDVIP docs always measure, called ApoBs, they dropped. Here's another slide that just emphasizes that point. We can see drops 
in total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides eating a paleolithic diet. Here's a slide, multiple different studies showing the effects of paleo style eating on blood pressure. There's a consistent drop, sometimes better than others, depending on where you start. Finally, I think we all look at the Mediterranean diet as the healthiest diet out there. And no doubt, it's a fantastic diet. It's been shown to reduce cardiac risk, dementia, stroke risk. Here's a slide looking at 29 men with prediabetes and diabetes. Some were put on a paleo style diet and some were put on the Mediterranean style diet. The top black line on each of these slides is these patients at baseline. It's their baseline blood sugar and then their sugar excursion after eating. And those are almost superimposable. So these people were identical in terms of their pre-treatment sugars. After three months of eating a paleo style diet, you can see on the paleo slide, fasting sugars lower, peak sugars lower, but in the Mediterranean style diet, it isn't. There was a 1.1 inch greater waste reduction eating paleo versus Mediterranean style eating. Weight loss was significant in both groups, but more significant in the paleo style. Blood sugars normalized in all the men eating paleo, but only some of the men eating Mediterranean style. Here's something interesting I wanted to show in. I drink a coffee called Bulletproof Coffee, which is very interesting product. It was uh, founded by a man named Dave Asprey, and there's a whole website devoted to this, which is incredible and incredibly interesting. Bulletproof Coffee is a great tasting, high quality coffee, which you buy from the Bulletproof website. And in the coffee, you blend two tablespoons of grass-fed butter, all the benefits that grass-fed products have, the vitamin K2, the conjugated linoleic acids, the omega-3s, and I dump another tablespoon of an oil you buy from the website called medium chain triglyceride oil. It's like purified coconut oil. It increases fat burning and produces a sense of satiety. When I have this in the mornings, I can sometimes go to one or two o'clock in the day without even thinking about food, and that is so unlike me. Here's a science slide looking at what happens when you include these medium chain triglyceride oils in your diet. On the left hand side, you can see that it increases energy expenditure, calorie burning. And on the right hand side, it increases your sense of fullness, which prevents weight gain. This is something you definitely want to talk to your doctor about. You definitely want to get your cholesterol checked about eight weeks after starting this because this is quite a bit of fat and about one in five people, we will see a rise in cholesterol, so be careful with this. Here's a little piece on aging. These rhesus monkeys are at the end of their life. Both of these rhesus monkeys are about 27 and a half years old. They're the same age. This is an experiment we could not do in humans. The monkey on the left was allowed to eat whatever it wanted, whenever it wanted, as much as it wanted, its entire life. The monkey on the right was calorie restricted to the tune of 15 or 20% reduction in calories for its entire life. This is the one part I will talk about calories. The paleo diet is great, but you can overdo calories on any diet. So stop eating when you're full. Restricting calories in multiple different species does turn on genes which help to preserve our cells and help us to live longer. What actually makes us age? What's happening in our cells that make us age? Well, when we eat our bagels, our breads, our rice, our pasta, our potatoes, all those things, again, they turn into sugars in our body. And that sugar binds to proteins all over our body. So at 98.6 degrees over 70 years, all those sugars, if they bind to the brain, can cause dementia. If they bind to the skin, they might cause wrinkles. If they bind to the heart, they might cause heart disease in the kidney, kidney disease. And those products are called AGEs, or advanced glycation end products. That's when a sugar binds to a protein. That's what happens in our bodies. We can also consume advanced glycation end products that are already formed. If we throw meat at a high temperature on a grill and baste it with barbecue sauce, which is full of sugar and high fructose corn syrup, that meat is going to form a lot of advanced glycation end products, and those are going to end up aging us as well. What's the most famous advanced glycation end product? We check it all the time. It's called hemoglobin A1C. A diabetic has circulating blood sugar. 
Well, some of those circulating blood sugars bind to red blood cells. Red blood cells are proteins. When we measure hemoglobin A1c, we're measuring advanced glycation end products. What patient group gets more aging-related diseases, more dementia, more heart disease, more cancers, more kidney disease? It's diabetics because they have the highest levels of circulating blood sugar and they're forming more of these advanced glycation end products. What about fructose? We talked a lot about glucose. Well, fructose is even worse. Fructose forms seven times as many advanced glycation end products. That glass of orange juice you have in the morning, ounce per ounce, has more fructose, more sugar than a Coke, and is gonna to lead to more advanced glycation end products and more fat formation. This plant on the upper part of this slide is the blue agave plant, which is used to make tequila. It's also used to make agave nectar, which is an artificial sweetener that has 90% fructose, all of which turns to fat in our bodies. The other products on here we all recognize, many of the cereals, the breads, ketchup, all contains a lot of fructose in the form of high fructose corn syrup. Here's a slide for our docs. I'm gonna boil it down and make it simple. Fructose enters cells, this is a liver cell, just like glucose or sugar does. But in the cell, it behaves a lot differently than glucose. Fructose turns into fat almost immediately, and that's what the triglycerides are. When your liver starts to get fatty, insulin doesn't work as well. And so even though fructose doesn't cause the pancreas to make more insulin, it indirectly causes the pancreas to make more insulin because you become resistant to the effects of insulin and need to make more. What else does it do? Well, when your liver gets fatty, the liver's not happy. The liver wants to get rid of that fat, so it starts spitting out giant fat balls called VLDL particles, which turn into lots of little nasty cholesterol particles, which lead to heart disease. What else does fructose do? It actually raises uric acid levels. We know uric acid causes gout. What else does uric acid cause? It causes high blood pressure. So if you're eating a lot of foods very rich in fructose and you have high blood pressure, cutting those out would be a smart idea. What about exercise? I really try to spend a lot of time talking to my patients about how important exercise is. If you're young or if you have young patients, I strongly suggest going to beachbody.com. If patients are motivated to exercise at home, there are some 25 minute and 30 minute workouts, which are just fantastic. Patients don't have to get in their cars uh, and, and they're very good. How do we lose weight exercising? I always pictured a blob of fat in my stomach just burning off as I exercise, but that's not actually what happens. What happens is when we build muscle, we build energy burning units. Those energy burning units are called mitochondria, and that's what churns through sugar and fat and burns it up. Fat breakdown is stimulated when we exercise. Why? Because insulin level is lower. When insulin's down, the prison guard is off duty, we can release fat. Leptin also increases, so when we exercise, the I'm full hormone is feeding back to our brains, giving us a sense of fullness. So you've got appetite reduction from exercising. You've got the endorphins that make you want to do it again. And in terms of cortisol, when you exercise, cortisol levels go up because it's a stress hormone, but chronically, exercise brings our cortisol levels down, which helps to keep belly fat from depositing. Finally, and you'll have to take my word for this, the Krebs cycle in mitochondria, which burns all that energy, it burns it faster when you're exercising regularly. Finally, what's the best way to prevent dementia? It's to exercise regularly. It's not reading books and doing math and Sudoku puzzles. It's exercising regularly. And this is a slide that shows you why. When we exercise, it's been discovered that we release a chemical called brain-derived neurotropic factor that increases new brain cell formation in the memory part of the brain. That's called the hippocampus. All those cells you knocked out in college that you, that you thought were never coming back, they're coming back if you exercise regularly. What else increases new brain cell formation? Here's the list. Dark chocolate, the anthocyanins in blueberries, caffeine, as in caffeinated coffee, green tea, and finally, high enough doses of omega-3 fatty acids. I try to get 1,000 milligrams of the DHA component of my omega-3 fatty acid. That's the amount that works. As promised, these are all of the books that I read, and I read many more. 
These are the authors who deserve the real credit. They provided the information that went into this talk, so I want to give credit where credit is due. Finally, I do have a Facebook page, a professional page. This is the address, and remember, patients, doctors, it's never too late to be who you might have been. This talk was delivered live at an awards banquet a couple of weeks ago, which provided an opportunity for interaction and a little more animation. Uh, it wasn't quite as contrived, and I did get some questions and answers at the end, and I tried to remember those questions. The first question was, won't all the eggs uh, and meat raise my cholesterol? And the answer is, you saw the slides that showed that actually we tend to see a drop in total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and especially triglycerides. Carbohydrates really turn into triglycerides, and when those triglycerides are stored in the liver as fat, we make lots of nasty cholesterol particles called LDL particles or ApoBs, cutting your carbohydrates down and increasing healthy fats will actually drop the numbers of those particles. But I always ask patients to do a before and an after, eight to 12 weeks later, just to monitor things. I got a question about my take on artificial sweeteners. So the artificial sweeteners that a lot of us are familiar with, the colored packets, we'll leave it at that, produce something called a cephalic phase insulin response. What is that? Well, when our tongues taste the sweetness of these artificial sweeteners, our brain thinks we're about to get a meal and it starts releasing insulin long before a single calorie has been absorbed. So these artificial sweeteners turn on fat making long before any calories are absorbed. What's my bet for the best sweetener out there? It's called Stevia. Stevia is natural. It comes from a leaf. There are multiple brands of Stevia out there, but Stevia in studies hasn't shown the same cephalic or brain phase insulin release. And there was one very neat small study I recently read showing that it might actually cut down on oxidation or damage to LDL or bad cholesterol, which might actually reduce cardiac risk. We can't say that, but it was a very intriguing study. I got asked for my take on veganism and vegetarianism. And my first statement is, this is a modern luxury. Eating vegan or vegetarian is something that our hunter-gatherer ancestors would not have had the luxury to do. Gorillas, for instance, are vegans. Gorillas have small brains, big bodies, and spend 80% of their waking hours in search of and consuming food. There are studies showing that because fat intake on a vegan diet tends to be very low, brain size is smaller. Now, whether that translates into any cognitive problems in the future, who knows? One of the big criticisms of the paleo diet is the expense of eating the paleo diet. And I agree, it is expensive to buy healthier meat, wild-caught fish, and good fruits and vegetables. But I think looking at farmer's markets is important. When you give up all of the grain-based foods that we're used to snacking on, all of the processed stuff, you save money. And that savings could be put toward healthier food choices. We shop a lot online for our meats. Uh, there's a website we go to called U.S. Wellness Meats, which has a ton of, of healthy stuff, and it's shipped in refrigerated packets. I find it to be an amazing resource for our family. Finally, one of the chemists in the audience, this was an audience of chemists, asked me my take on nutritional ketosis. So I think nutritional ketosis is a state that most of us probably lived in when we were hunters and gatherers. We suffered through long periods of starvation. And when we weren't eating sugars, we had to come up with an alternate fuel source. And our bodies have this neat trick. When you really cut carbohydrates down below 50 grams of turning our stored fat into an energy source called ketones, which can be burned very efficiently by every single cell in the body. And if you put yourself into nutritional ketosis, there's a tendency to gain a lot less weight and to lose a lot of weight. We see less cancer. We certainly see less advanced glycation end product formation because you're eating less sugar. And so there's a chance that you may age less rapidly. And we see a lot less diabetes.